Hi, and welcome to my custom Dungeons & Dragons gaming table build. I will outline the steps taken to make this project, as well as the tools required, so that with a little work, you can make one yourself. Alright, let's get started. The first tool is the chop saw. It's used to make straight cuts and 45 degree angle cuts on this project. Next up is the table saw. This is used for making long cuts. I used it to cut some of the plywood for this project, as well as making the strips of wood that become the chessboard. The nail gun is used in conjunction with an air compressor. A lot of people assume the nails hold the project together, but it's actually not true. The wood glue does that. The nails mostly hold the pieces together while the glue dries. The power drill is a very common tool for most people. On this project, it's used to assemble the base frame and to drill the holes for the player station supports. The auger bit is likely the only specialty tool you need to buy for this project. It's used to drill the large diameter holes for the player station support bars, which are lengths of one half inch round bar. I went with 5 8 diameter holes to make the bars easy to slide in and out. Wood glue's up next, and as I said before, glue is what does the job of holding the whole project together, so the stronger you can get, the better. But remember, once it dries, those pieces are pretty much together forever, so make sure to test fit before applying it. The router is used to round over edges on this project to make them uniform and smooth, and it's also used for trimming the opening in the plywood that fits the TV. You'll see that later. This is the roundover bit. I chose to use roundover because it's simple and comfortable to rest your arms on, but if you wanted a little bit of a more detailed edge, you could go with something like a cove bit as well. The trim bit is designed to run along a guide to make accurate cuts. Luckily with this project, we end up creating a guide kind of by accident by creating the TV frame, so it makes it really easy to cut that opening by using this bit. The palm sander is another pretty common household tool. Um, it's used on this project mainly for speed. You could hand sand if you want. I use sandpaper grits from 60 to 220 on this project. You can never have enough clamps. The more you use, the tighter your fit will be, and the less risk of warping. I used 10 of varied sizes on this project, but honestly, I always wished I had a few more. Pick up as many as you can before you start. Alright, I know this one's pretty obvious, but a tape measure is standard for woodworking projects. Remember, measure thrice and cut once. And that is even more important when cutting multiple pieces that have to be the same size. Like, say, 64 cubes for a chessboard. I use foam brushes to apply the stain and polyurethane finishes for a few reasons. One, they're cheap and disposable, and two, they don't leave streaks or bristles in the finish. So the pencil pretty much goes hand in hand with the tape measure. But this is more of a don't use pen or marker warning, as those are harder to erase on a project and just make more work or sloppy work in the long run. The carpenter square is invaluable when making cuts. This tool allows you to draw a straight line between measurements, and it's the easiest way to make sure your measurements are accurate. And finally, we have safety gear. Again, I know it's obvious, but work gloves, safety glasses, hearing protection, and even a dust mask are all things you should always use when doing any woodworking. It might be inconvenient, but you won't think that when they save you from a mistake. All right, now that the boring stuff's out of the way, it's on to the fun part, the build process. The first step is building the base frame. I clamp temporary blocking pieces to set up where the inner frame would be, and this also sets up the width of the drawers and the size of the pockets that the table legs will slot into. The important thing for this step is keeping in mind that the frame is currently upside down. This allows you to place the braces level with the top of the frame using your work surface as a guide. You can see here an example of the removable blocking I use. You clamp the guide blocking in place, then butt the brace against it, which will be fixed in place as well. Apply glue to the brace and press it firmly in place. Then you clamp the brace where you want it to be and pop up in a few nails with the nail gun just for added support. You can see here how many braces make up one side of the table, and for all those spaces in between, they were set up using removable bracing, which guarantees that both sides will line up perfectly. Once all of the braces are installed and the glue's had time to dry, you can flip the frame over. Then you install the inner frame around the perimeter. This frame will support the TV frame as well as the tabletop plywood. Next is the installation of the TV frame. I use the TV to set up the frame dimensions, making sure to leave enough room to easily take the TV out if needed. 
I also cut those gaps in the TV frame to allow ventilation and easy access for cables and the hard drive and things like that. Now it's time to install the outer frame. I used 45 degree angle cuts on the ends here because it makes the table look a lot cleaner. When you're doing this stage, you're going to want to use as many clamps as possible to minimize the warping while the glue dries. When installing the outer frame, I used the player station support bars to ensure the inner and outer holes aligned perfectly as well. Now you flip the table back over. In this step, you're going to attach the plywood bottom for the drawers and the TV support. I also chose to round over the edges and stain at this point, because if you don't do it now, it's going to be a pain to do it later. Next, you're going to flip the table back over for the final time and install the plywood for the table surface. Then you're going to drill a hole in the middle big enough to fit your router trim bit. You're going to use the trim bit and the TV frame below as a guide, and that'll cut a perfect opening for the TV. Next, you're going to stain the whole table. From here, we begin permanently attaching covering parts. And if you don't stain it now, it'll be too hard to stain properly later, and it'll ultimately just end up looking sloppy. Here, I also installed the tabletop perimeter frame. This frame supports the outsides of the removable player stations, as well as the chessboard. Like before, these pieces need to be pre-stained before being installed. The next step is installing all of the non-moving pieces for the dining tabletop outer edge. You will need to pre-stain all of these pieces as well, for once they're installed, you can't get easy access to their undersides. Next, we're going to begin installing the lids. To do this, you're going to take the hinges and trace them onto the lid and onto the frame, then use a chisel to mortise out a slight groove for the hinge to fit in. This makes sure that while the lid is closed, the hinge will sit flush, so it removes the need to sand all of the edges. That being said, you may need to sand the edges anyways. Sometimes wood warps and it just doesn't sit quite right and you just need to take off a little bit to make it all nice and smooth. Now that the lids are installed and functional and all of the edges have been made smooth, you can begin the round over of the top and bottom edges of the table. You round over the top so that the table is comfortable to lean against and you round over the bottom so the lids are comfortable to operate. Next comes the tabletop TV frame. This frame is half an inch from the edge of the opening. This allows for space for the plexiglass to rest. The frame also acts as supports for the inside edge of the player stations. Again, these must be pre-stained before installed. The next step is building the chessboard. To start with, you're going to cut 64 identical cubes. I used a table saw to cut long 2 inch wide strips and then used the chop saw with blocking to cut those into 2 inch lengths. Once you have all the pieces cut, you stain half of them one color and half the other color you choose. Then you start grouping the pieces into pairs of alternating colors. Glue and clamp them together, making sure they are perfectly aligned. Once those pairs have had time to dry, you take two pairs and match them together and glue and clamp them as well. This is a very long process and another reason you want a ton of clamps. Once you have them assembled into lengths of eight pieces, you can begin assembling them into the board. I chose to do this two lengths at a time, alternating the rows and allowing for time for the glue to dry in between additional rows. Once your board is completed, you can start adding the leaves to the sides of the board. The holes in these parts allow you to put your finger in so you can lift the board out from underneath without needing to remove all of the player stations first. The final step for the chessboard is adding the outer frame. The frame adds additional support to prevent warping or cracking for this piece when it's removed. The next step is cutting the player stations to length. The stations are rounded over top and bottom on three sides only. This is because the non-rounded side rests against the edge of the table flat and gets the holes drilled in it for the support rods. The final step is applying the polyurethane finish to the entire project. This is done in three coats, sanding with finer sandpaper grits in between the coats to get a nice smooth finish. I chose polyurethane because it helps protect the wood from water damage and food stains. And that finishes the project. Um, I'd wanted to do this one for quite some time and I'm really glad I did. You might notice I didn't include the legs in this design. It's because I actually recycled the legs from my old table, which happened to fit perfectly in the pockets I designed. But the initial plan was to use 4x4 material and that would work just as well. 
As I said, I intended to use uh, plexiglass for the screen cover. I did that for a couple of reasons. The plexiglass protects the screen of the television from scratches, from minis or crumbs, things like that. And the other thing is that the plexiglass is actually able to be written on with dry erase markers. It's just a nice little bit of added utility. Here you can see a sample of one of the maps being projected. This is just a basic grid map. I use this probably most often when I'm DMing just so I can draw on it the rough layout of hallways or rooms that the players happen to be in without having to dig around for a detailed map. Here you can see though a, a much more detailed map in use. Uh, I found this one free online and in fact I found tons of them free online and I love using them. They just add that little bit of flavor, a little bit of uh, depth to the combat and I think it really immerses the characters and the players uh, in the game a little bit more than just a basic gridded map. Here you can see one of the side tables, one of the player stations in use. It fits a full binder comfortably and the drawers are deep enough to hold like a can of pop. I like also keeping pencils and other goods in the stations just in case the players forget their gear. And that wraps up this tutorial. I hope that you found it helpful or that it at least gave you some ideas for your own table build. Feel free to ask me any questions that you may have and I will try my best to respond. Uh, you can also check out my DeviantArt page for some of my other projects. I'll leave a link to the description below. Um, thanks guys and I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great one.